now I need to probably get a stool. Hey, that's a good idea. I think I'll get a stool. Now there's a good idea. Oh boy. I've been standing up all day and doing these devotionals outside in the sunlight. Kind of got me tired. <laughs> You know, there's a beauty that comes with not just knowing God or walking with Him, but what He does inside you that causes you to look at things in a different way. You begin to appreciate more the things that are around you, the detail there is in trees. If I put my glasses back on. But what you can't see outside over here is uh, kind of the wide variety of trees that I have that are reaching up over the apartment complex. And as I watch them change through the seasons, you know, there's leaves right now that are beginning to change to yellow and probably going to fall soon. That's why we call it fall, by the way. <laughs> but there's also, at this time of year, every year, without fail, there's a star that is always in the east that, for me, represents the Lord's coming. Now, that's not a scriptural teaching. It's not a biblical teaching. It's for me. It's something personal, like my hummingbird that visits me in the daytime. Well, by night, there's this one star that rises in the east, you know, comes up over this tree. You know, and I look at it and I think, you know, for me, Lord, that's a sign of your coming. And for me, it is. And it may not be for you, but it's, it's a good sign for me. You know, it's something that makes me and puts me in remembrance of Him. You know, they teach us that in Jewish culture, that part of my heritage, that the reason why the Sabbath was given was to remember and observe, because it reminded you of God and put your attention back where it should be. And you know, people get confused about that, and it's meant to be a day of rest, and it's supposed to be just kind of a, like an Enoch time, you know, walking away with God and relaxing, not making it into this talis and tzitzis and tying and binding and getting all carried away. But, but a day to take a moment to back off, be still, really, in the desert to stay in your tent. <laughs> you know, because you had extra mana, so, you know, all you had to do was stay in the tent and eat. But just a day to reflect and be quiet, be still. I know when I was living in Israel at the time, that was the most fascinating thing to me was that I, was, I lived in Jerusalem. I lived over in uh, Rehavia, and uh, it's kind of like an artist community. It's over by the Reform uh, Temple, and just around the corner from the yeah, Messianic group. And... Uh, it was great, you know, I loved living there. And um, whenever Shabbos came or whenever Saturday came, it was so still, you could almost feel the land came to a calm and a quiet. It was wonderful, I really liked it. It was peaceful. And in that gentle quietness, you could hear God speak, you know, and that's kind of what we need to get to a place of is to not hear the noise of many waters, the voices that are telling us to do this or to do that, the anxiety of our own emotions that sometimes tells us, oh, I feel so bad, you know what I did? Or the religious ideas we have that say, oh, well, I got to tithe, or I got to do this, or I got to do that, or else I'm not perfect and accepted by God. Whatever it may be. Because God really doesn't want you like that. He doesn't want you to come to Him in all, you know, hyperness, all jumping up and down excited, barking like a dog, or rolling like an animal on the floor. He doesn't want you to come to Him all, you know, gaga and goo-goo-eyed, because He wants you to come to Him every day. 
just normal, the way you are. If you get filled with the wonder of His love, you just peacefully come to God in His presence and you enjoy Him for who He is. Because you don't react to His presence so much so that you freak out. But rather, God wants to have a personal time with you, that you walk with Him and talk with Him in a peaceful way. So there's a time and a place, I guess, for getting excited, but it seems like that's mainly in crowds. And, you know, I've seen crowds turn into mobs, you know, just as easy as they were a bunch of rejoicing, praising people. Sometimes they get carried away. And I've seen great revivals go off tangent simply because of that. Somebody in there, maybe just one, had this wild idea, and suddenly that wild idea became a collective idea and they all got carried away on it and started doing the same thing then it was no longer people but just a mob so when the spirit of god comes upon you you know, yield to hearing god and letting him lead you as opposed to letting your emotions drive you into something that you never would have done without having seen it either on TV or in a crowd or someplace that except you'd seen it before, you never would have done it on your own and not alone with God. Direction by impulse. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Jude 20. There was nothing either of the nature of impulse or of cold-bloodedness about our Lord Jesus, but only a calm strength that never got into a panic. Most of us develop our Christianity along the line of our temperament and our moods by our emotions, but not along the line of God and His relationship. Impulse is a trait in natural life, but our Lord always ignores it because it hinders the development of the life of a disciple. He did nothing impulsively. Watch how the Spirit of God checks impulses. His checks bring a rush of self-conscious foolishness which makes us instantly want to vindicate ourselves. Impulse is all right in a child, but it is disastrous in a man or a woman. An impulsive man is always a headed man. Impulse has to be trained into intuition by discipline. In other words, when you think of something that it comes to you and you go, hmm, that looks like it might be that's an impulse. You know, you go, oh, that might be discernment, but you have to wait on the facts to validate it. But if you act upon that impulse, then you're impulsive. You see, you're not dealing with the reality of what God is doing. You're dealing with the emotional response to what might be what God is doing. And you don't know the difference. So any impulse that comes along, whether of God, of a sugar rush, of you taking, you know, Taking and spiking one of those power drinks, you know, and suddenly going, yeah, I feel like I've got a word from the Lord, you know. <laughs> yeah, sure you do. you got a heck of a lot of caffeine going, you know, and I'm sure you made some connections somewhere. <laughs> but that's why emotions aren't the greatest form of devotion. The greater reality is relationship that is continually abiding in a conversation with God. That's why the apostles were not known for getting wound up and suddenly proclaiming the word, but rather they published the word so that they could be tested and tried to see if it was of God or whether the prophet spoke impulsively. For me personally, you know, I hear a lot of people tell me about what God is doing and I kind of go, I don't know, it sounds a little emotional to me. You know, I think devotion would be more of a continual relationship, not a quick fix shot, you know, sugar or adrenaline rush. Discipleship is built entirely on the supernatural grace of God. Walking on the water is easy to impulsively pluck, but walking on dry land as a disciple of Jesus Christ is a completely different thing. You know, it's easy to follow a miracle. It's a whole lot harder to follow Jesus in a daily discipline that you are doing what God would have you to do. And I'll give you a great example. 
when there's a bad marriage, how fast do we bail on a relationship than to stay what we've dedicated to God to do? Because you see, God may have placed you in that relationship to save the soul of those that are in it, whether they be your children, her children, somebody's children, no children, or the fact that you're a child and you need to grow up in this relationship. And that may be the purpose of why God says, look at the discipline of life, not the emotion of it. It's easy to fall in love and to fall out of love. But the discipline of the fruit of the Spirit of what God gives in the love that He's talking about is a continual thing that always pours out upon a person. It doesn't end just because you don't feel like it. It keeps going whether you feel like it or not. We do not need the grace of God to stand crisis. Human nature and pride are sufficient for that. We can face the strain magnificently, but it does require the supernatural grace of God to live 24 hours every day as a saint and to go through the drudgery as a discipline and a disciple of Jesus. It's so easy to make a one-time commitment and then when nobody's looking, go back to being a sinner rather than a saint. It is inbred in us that we have to do exceptional things for God, but we don't have to. We have to be exceptional in the ordinary things, to be holy in the mean streets, among mean people, and that is not learned in five minutes. As a matter of fact, sometimes, for some Christians, it's not learned in a lifetime. I think one of the things that amazed me about the apartment complex I just came from was that there was a man who was just across the way from our apartment that used to beat his wife, you know, and he would just haul off and, you know, we used to say coal cocker, bam, you know, and you'd hear it and, you know, somebody would call the police, you know, and the police would come and they'd haul him away and then he'd get out and come back. Then they'd get in a fight again and he'd haul him away and bring him back, you know. And I started praying about the situation and started sitting on my staircase because I started looking at it and saying, you know what? This has got to stop because they had two children and they were young children. And so as I prayed, I kept thinking, Lord, you know, what do you want me to do? And so I'd sit out there and watch and sure enough, as long as I was watching, the fight would stop. But when I went back inside, then because there wasn't that God moving in the midst of it, it seemed as though suddenly they were able to and be free to go back out and deck at each other and fight. Well, as it turned out, one day I heard this scream and this thud and then I felt the building shake and I went downstairs and saw the gentleman grabbing the woman by the hair and I walked up and I said, let go, very calmly. And I stood there completely relaxed without saying a word and he came up and he was kind of brawny and scrawny sort of but he, you could tell he was wiry strong and so he got right in my face you know and he started talking and giving me what used to be called lip and you know shooting off his anger and wrath and everything and I just stood there without a look eye to eye uh, without blinking without thinking just waiting for the Lord to tell me what to do and God didn't say speak so I didn't say anything after about 15 minutes my wife was upstairs watching <laughs> poor woman after about 15 minutes this going on he finally was calming down and finally said anything and he said started changing his tone he says you hate me don't you he says you, you despise me and you disgust me and finally I stopped and I was wearing glasses at the time so I took off my glasses and I said looked him right in the eye I said I don't hate anyone I said, frankly, I think it's kind of dumb what you're doing. I said, that's your wife. I said, those are your kids. I said, just don't hit them in front of me because, you know, that's something that you shouldn't be doing and you're going to wind up in jail. You know, but frankly, you know, it's your choice. You know, what you decide to do, you're going to pay for it. It's not going to be me doing it, but you're going to wind up there anyways. You know, and he said, so what are you going to do, call the cops? I said, yeah. 
not only would I call the cops, but I said I'd tell them right where you live and exactly what you've done. So I would prefer that if you don't want anybody knowing, you take it inside. Because what's your business is your business. But I said, as far as hating, I said, I don't hate anyone. I said, I just think sometimes people act dumb. Well, then he got hauled off again and thrown in jail for a while and came back. And the funny thing was, was that as many times as he came back, he kept looking up at that apartment that I lived in. And gradually we finally moved over here. But he kept looking up there and thinking about what was said. And others, as it turned out, had seen what had gone on. And when we moved, I gave away one of my barbecues because I couldn't keep it. And they were so blessed, some of the people. And as it turned out, there was a couple of Baptist and Christians there who saw it. And they came up to me later as we were moving and said, you know, really respect what you did. You know, he says, you know, I've been kind of backslidden and really hadn't talked to God, you know, and watching you not, you know, torque this guy, you know, meaning drop him to the ground or get in a fight with him. But the fact that you came out and took a stand, you know, and heck, I was I could have done that a long time ago, but I just was too afraid, you know, to do anything. And I told him, I said, look, you know, it's not about whether you're backslidden or not. I said, it's not about you know whether you have a gift to the spirit or anything like that, because he had talked about something. You know, and I said, really, all it's about is just Jesus. You know, I said, Jesus is in me. I said, whether somebody kills me or, you know, I live or die, I said, I'm going home. You know, I said, this place isn't my home. I said, I don't matter to me whether, you know, he took a swing and I let him hit me. I said, I've been there before. I said, I'd probably let him mop me up with, you know, with what he, with the ground in the pavement. But then that woman wouldn't have got beat up. And he said, man, I couldn't do that. I said, that's the point. Neither can I. But when Jesus is in you, when you know him, when you walk with him every day, then he only takes you the place you're ready for. He doesn't put you in a place you're not ready for. And I said, you'll never be ready. You'll only be able to be responsing, res responding to what God wants you to do, and then he'll give you the strength to do it. So when that time comes, you'll be able to do it, because Jesus said, don't think about what you'll say at the time, but wait for the Holy Spirit to lead you. So I said, you sound like you're Pentecostal, so you know what the Holy Spirit is. And he said, yeah. I said, well then, wait until you're sure. Otherwise, don't do it. And he said to me, you know, like, something about, you know, have you ever been in those kind of situations before? And I said, sure, lots of times. So as a matter of fact, I expect God to do something about it. He goes, I never thought of it that way. I said, well, that's what I do. I said, I expect God to act. And if he doesn't, then I tell him, look, if you don't do something about it, I will. And then God has always come through. Now, I'm not telling you and your relationship with the Lord to do that, but <laughs> God knows me. <laughs> and so does my wife. And she sees me when I have to exercise some restraint on someone. I don't have a problem taking them and removing them from a situation. In fact, I wish God would let me do it. <laughs> it's kind of fun. But it's not a fight then. I just take them and move them from whatever situation they're in at the time. And so, it's not about being a dormant, but it is about letting God do what He wants to do, irregardless of what you think you should do. So you can't go by feelings, and you can't go by anger, and you can't go by emotion, but you can go by devotion to a God who is living and alive in you and wants to do with you what He chooses to do today. As you walk with Him, as you talk with Him, as you let Him lead you in your way, and you'll find the way that you're going is right where He's at.